Welcome to the UCL Center for Anesthesia student podcast series, an introduction to pain pathways and mechanisms. In this podcast, the following topics will be explored. Introduction to pain, nociceptors, primary afferent fibers, signaling up the spinal cord, pain processing in the brain, inhibition of pain transmission, visceral and neuropathic pain. I'd like to begin by defining a few terms that will be used in discussion. The first is pain. In this context, pain describes the unpleasant feeling that is a vital part of the nervous system because it warns the body of potential or actual injury. It is both a sensory and emotional experience, meaning psychological factors like mood, beliefs, or past experiences can have an effect on an individual's perception of pain. There are a few types of pain, including acute pain, which is short term, chronic pain, which persists after the normal healing process has occurred, and recurrent pain, which leaves and returns. Nociceptors. These are specialized receptors that are located at free endings of A delta and C fibers, which we'll talk about on the next slide. These nociceptors detect noxious stimuli, turn the stimuli into electrical signals, which are then sent to the central nervous system. Nociceptors are found in the skin, viscera, muscles, joints, and meninges. Looking at the table, you'll see some different categories of skin nociceptors. A delta mechanosensitive nociceptors detect mechanical stimuli, like when you slam your finger in the car door. A delta mechanothermal, these detect thermal stimuli, so when you touch a hot pan. Lastly, C polymodal nociceptors can detect mechanical, thermal, or chemical stimuli, so they're a little more versatile. Primary afferent fibers. These are nerves that carry the signal from the point of stimuli to the spinal cord. In the diagram, you can see that the stimuli is going from the skin up the afferent nerve and eventually to the spinal cord. The opposite of an afferent nerve is an efferent nerve. There are three types of primary afferent fibers, A beta, A delta, and C fibers. And if you remember, A delta and C fibers have the nociceptors on their free endings. In the chart, you'll see some characteristics about the three types. A beta fibers transmit non-noxious stimuli, so this is responsible for your sense of touch. They have a low activation threshold, the largest diameter, as well as the highest level of myelination, so the signal is transmitted quite rapidly. Next, A delta fibers, these transmit noxious stimuli, specifically your feelings of rapid, sharp, very localized pain. They have a smaller diameter with some myelination, so the signal is transmitted quickly, but not as fast as A beta. Lastly, C fibers. These also transmit noxious stimuli, but these will be the feelings of slow, dull, not really localized pain. They have a very high activation threshold, the smallest diameter, and a low level of myelination, so the signal is transmitted very slowly. And here is a picture of the three fibers together. Nociceptive signaling. Nociceptors can be stimulated from inflammatory mediators released by damaged tissue. An example of an inflammatory mediator is bradykinin, which can be seen in the left image. These mediators can also lower the activation threshold of nociceptors. In other words, less stimulation is required for activation. An example of this is your legs feeling sore the day after a tough workout. Signaling in the dorsal horn. The dorsal horn, also called the posterior column, is the area of gray matter within the spinal cord. In the image, the arrow points to one area of the dorsal horn. The symmetrical area on the other side is also part of the dorsal horn. In the dorsal horn, secondary afferent neurons synapse with A delta and C fibers. Primary afferent nerves release excitatory neurotransmitters. And lastly, the activity of secondary neurons is affected by the activity of afferent, neuron, interneuron, and efferent neuron pathways. Ascending the spinal cord. There are two main pathways that carry nociceptive signals up the spinal cord to the brain, the spinothalamic tract and the spinoreticular tract. In the first pathway, secondary afferent neurons ascend the contralateral spinothalamic tract to nuclei in the thalamus. Third-order neurons travel up and terminate in the somatosensory cortex. 
There are also signals projected into the periaqueductal gray matter. This pathway is important for pain localization. Simultaneously, in the spinal reticular tract, fibers ascend the contralateral cord to the brainstem reticular formation, then project to the thalamus, hypothalamus, and ultimately the cortex. This pathway is involved in the emotional aspect of pain. Pain processing in the brain. This is affected by many factors, for example, cognition, belief, mood, and genetics. Many areas of the brain are activated during the acute pain experience, which can be seen in this functional MRI image. The pain matrix. This includes the thalamus, primary and secondary somatosensory cortex, S1 and S2, as well as the prefrontal cortex. Inhibiting pain transmission. There are two ways that pain is inhibited in the body. The first is the gate control theory. This was developed by Malzac and Wall in 1965 and describes inhibition at the spinal cord level. This inhibition is why rubbing your head after bumping it makes it hurt less. Rubbing your head activates A-beta fibers, which in turn activates inhibitory interneurons in the dorsal horn, and these are what inhibits the pain signals being transmitted by C-fibers. The second method, descending inhibitory pathways. The periaqueductal gray matter and rostral ventromedial medulla are two important parts of the nervous system involved in this type of inhibition. Both contain high levels of opioid receptors, which helps explain why opioids are analgesics. These descending pathways project into the dorsal horn, inhibiting pain transmission monoaminergically, which is a fancy word meaning it uses monoamine neurotransmitters like noradrenaline and serotonin. Visceral and neuropathic pain. Visceral pain is pain arising from the internal organs. The signals are carried by C fibers, so the pain will be poorly localized and dull. It is associated with autonomic changes like nausea, vomiting, changes in heart rate and blood pressure, as well as an emotional response. It is triggered by smooth muscle distension or contraction, stretching around an organ, ischemia, necrosis, or irritation by chemicals produced in the inflammatory process. Referred pain can also be experienced due to convergence of different afferents on the same dorsal horn neurons in the spinal cord. An example of this is a patient complaining of shoulder pain after a laparoscopic surgery due to stretching of the diaphragm. Neuropathic pain is pain caused by nerve damage in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. It is triggered by trauma or surgery, diabetes mellitus, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, ischemia, infection, or malignancy. It is described as a burning or electric shock type of pain. In this podcast, we have made some conclusions about pain and pain pathways. Pain is both a sensory and emotional experience, and it's important to understand that a patient's past experiences can affect their pain levels. Transmission of pain is the result of complex peripheral and central processes, and these processes can be regulated by facilitatory and inhibitory interactions. Please refer to the article, An Introduction to Pain Pathways and Mechanisms, found on the UCL Medical Students website. Also on this page, you will find additional sources that were used in the creation of this podcast. Podcast by Brittany Porter and Danielle Reddy, with contributors Dr. Francis Lung, Marcia Desjardins, and Mimi Levi. And special thanks to Dr. Rob Stevens. Thank you for watching.